has almost fallen into cardiac arrest and has almost lost the blood of the Lamb, presenting a blood-drained gospel. So let me read this story from my book, Undone. A young soldier lay face down in the mud, his heart barely beating, blood draining out and pooling around his head. His friend found him and lifted his body to rush him to a medevac, but suddenly the wounded soldier stopped breathing, his eyes fixed, and his body went limp in his friend's arms. Oh no, gasped his friend. I think he's dead. He moaned as he placed his body into the arms of the medic. The medic grabbed electrodes of a defibrillator and thrust the paddles to the soldier's chest. Stand back, he shouted, as bolts of electricity jolted the soldier's body, but he didn't respond. Trying again, the medic yelled, One, two, three. Suddenly, a monitor picked up a heartbeat. Immediately, the medic slipped a needle into the soldier's vein, and in moments, color returned to his ashen face. He was rushed to the nearest hospital, where he received an emergency blood transfusion, and a dead young man was brought back to life. The church is like that dying soldier. We need a blood transfusion. We've almost slipped into cardiac arrest. We've been riddled with subtle forms of materialism, humanism, mysticism, and deception, even heresy. And our senses have dulled, and the life has slowly and imperceptibly ebbed out. The church needs electrodes applied to her heart. She needs her soul defibrillated. She needs her veins infused with a fresh transfusion of the blood of Christ. She needs a heart-jolting revelation of the Lamb. Today, we're going to look at the resurrection, the ascension, the glorification, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the flood of the gospel on the earth. So would you pray with me now? Oh God, we come to you this morning asking you once again to revive your church. Jesus poured out blood to save the church, to give the Father a family. And we've drained the blood from our gospel from the message. I ask you, my God, to raise up men and women who will carry the blood of the Lamb to their families, to their churches, to the streets, to their neighborhoods. God, I even ask that there, there will be people in this room who will rise up and start works, that, that you'll put your hand upon them and they'll start something whether it be here or in other nations. God, let the gospel of Jesus Christ be revived in truth. And as the cross is lifted up and the blood of the Lamb infused back into the church, let deception, lukewarmness, materialism, and all that slithered its way into the church be broken. Fill us, God, with the Holy Spirit. Fill us, God, with revival. Not for our sake. Not to grow a church. Not to have a ministry. But revival for the sake of the Lamb. A revival of the Lamb, of the cross, of the blood. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to go right into the message. I have so much I'm trying to pack in today. So let's hold on to our seats. Pack, uh, buckle your seat belts and let's go. Jesus has been taken down from the cross. He's been laid in the tomb. And have you ever thought about the greatest man who ever walked this earth had only one or two or three, four people at his funeral? Oh, 
amazing. And as his body is placed into the tomb, the father looks down upon his son. And how do you think the father feels as he sees the son laid out, the corpse laid out in that tomb? Now it's early hours of the third day. And some of you say the third day, yes, because he went into the tomb on Friday. He was in the tomb all day Saturday and the day begins at sunset so the third day began at sunset on Saturday and he rose on the third day but you have to know the the Israeli the Jewish hours of the day early hours of the third day and the olive leaves stir and gleam I can't say it like I can write it so let me read you just a little from the Undone book about the resurrection and just picture this scene. In the early hours of the third day, while darkness still pervades the land, suddenly the leaves of the almond trees begin to rustle. A wind blows into the garden. Olive leaves stir and gleam in the brightness of the supernatural current. For it's not a wind at all. It's the person of the Holy Spirit breezing into the garden like a gust of heavenly wind toward the rock-hewn grave he rushes, reaching the boulder which is in front of the tomb. He whiffs through the rock and enters the tomb. Now he hesitates looking down on the corpse of the one he loves. There he is, laid out on the slab, hovering over the bruised and broken body of Jesus. He waits. Even as he hovered over the body, the, 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 the Mary herself, his mother, like an overshadowing glory cloud, like a haze of brilliance, now he overshadows the Holy Spirit, the corpse of Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. There lies Jesus, stiff and lifeless. No breath in his body. No blood flowing through his veins. No heartbeat in the chest of this one he loves. Now the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, that's the, the Hebrew word for Holy Spirit, the breath or wind of God trembles over the body of the lamb. He has ached for this moment. Closer he draws to the body of the son, waiting for the father's command. Here he is, hovering over the body of Jesus, waiting for the father. And finally, at the right moment, remember, if you know about the feast, it's the first fruits. And now Jesus Christ is getting ready to be the first fruit from the dead. So the Father thunders down to the Holy Spirit, raise my son from the dead as the first fruits from the dead, the fulfillment of the feast of first fruits. Now I want us to go into the Passion movie and watch the last scene as Jesus rises, still bearing wounds in his flesh. What a day. The glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many people do regard the cross as defeat. We're not to regard the cross as defeat and the resurrection as victory. Rather, the cross was the victory won and the resurrection, the victory endorsed, proclaimed, and demonstrated. Do you see the difference? The cross is where the battle occurred. The cross is where Satan was defeated. The cross is where... The cup was drained and, and, and sin was completely punished in Christ. The work was done at Calvary on the cross, but now the resurrection proclaims it, displays it. We Sometimes we, we read right over these scriptures and misunderstand what we're reading. Look at what it says in Romans 1.4. He was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. So we look at that and say, see, the power is all in the resurrection, not in the cross. That's not what that says. It says he was declared with power. In other words, the, the, the resurrection is what shows, displays, proclaims what he did on the cross. But yes, there is power in the resurrection. Why then have we emphasized the resurrection but not the crucifixion? 
You can't. You can't have the full power of the resurrection without the full power of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So I think the reason we have overlooked the power of the cross, even though Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul said, the message of the cross is the power of God. But I think the one reason probably that we have overlooked the power of the cross and only emphasized the power of the resurrection is because we didn't fully understand the Father's cup. Maybe we had a little bit of it in our head, but we didn't have it piercing our hearts. So do you see what I'm saying? Now we, now we see the cup. But never underestimate the power of the resurrection. The power outflowing from his resurrection. And uh, by the way, I'm so glad Mike has been raised from the dead. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and he's in this room and the Holy Spirit is on you. I see him on you. Just, just like he was. And I think you were listening through the door, right? Praise God. But the resurrection is, is the, in fact, it says this in Amplified, the power outflowing, outflowing from his resurrection. It is the power to minister. The resurrection is revival. It is, the, I mean, I don't mean that the resurrection is revival. I mean the power outflowing from his resurrection is the power of revival. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of that rushing river. But it's all resurrection power. So we don't ever want to diminish the power of the resurrection. We just want to have an understanding of the, the, the difference between the two. Now, that night, oh, I, I, I wish I had three more days to teach y'all, but we're packing a lot in the next few days. That evening, Jesus walks into the room and, dis, and, and, and surprises the disciples and what does he say to them when he walks in that room without even turning the knob or the lifting the, the lock? He says, see my hands and my feet. This is how we know when it's Jesus. After his crucifixion and resurrection, I mean, I, I remember John Kilpatrick telling a story about a, a, a person that looked just like Jesus Christ, like an angel coming into his room and saying that he was Jesus but he looked at his hands and there were no wounds. And he dismissed him. He was not Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ still bears wounds. And he made such an, an emphasis to the disciples to see those wounds. Look here. Look. See. See my hands and my feet. A week later, Thomas. And remember, Thomas didn't believe until he saw the wounds. And Jesus said, Thomas, look. Touch. Put your hand in my wound, in my side. Well, I can imagine what that would mean. I mean, when I was in India, this was, Thomas was just like the, the apostle that's so honored in India because he went to India. And you cannot doubt that because everywhere you see, you see signs of where Thomas had walked and Thomas had been. But I said to those Indians, I said, Brothers and sisters, Thomas walked this land. But remember, Thomas put his very hands in the side of Jesus Christ. Now his hands touched your land. And his hands were laid on some of your forefathers. So let's look at the wounds of Christ again. Let's come back to the Lamb. Let's come back to the cross. I'm telling you, that's their language. There's nowhere you can go that you can't bring the cross. Now... <laughs> Oh, it's so hard for me to stay off bunny tra trails when little thoughts come to me, but we won't. I was going to say something about Israel, but maybe I'll do that Saturday. The Bible says they will look on me, the one they pierced, and mourn. So let me encourage you. If you go through down times in your life, go to the cross, but I'm not talking about two st stakes of wood. I'm talking about beholding Jesus. I mean, I behold him probably more in heaven than actually on the cross now in my life. Why? Because in heaven, he still bears wounds. And so I look at his wounds. I behold the lamb in heaven on the throne. I just picture him in my heart. And it's those wounds that bring me back to life. It brought Thomas to life. So now Jesus, 40 days later, takes them out to the Mount of Olives. And what does he do? Well, the Bible says in Luke 24, I wish we had time to, and maybe I probably gave you that scripture to study. Are you all reading your Bible passages that we give you every day? Good, good. 
So now the Bible says that Jesus lifted up his hands and blessed them. And as he was blessing them, he rose. So what are they seeing as he rises? They're seeing his hands. They're seeing the wounds in his hands. And now the hands that bled, bless. And it, it, he's, as he's rising, he's like a high priest shedding blessings. As he rises, but he is the high priest. He is the high priest of heaven, we're told in Hebrews. So I want to look at this little video, if we can get that sound cord back into my computer. And uh, this is just a two minute video showing you very last the ascension. Of also Christ. One of his most because he's ascended, he's poured out his Holy Spirit. Well, that's where we're going to go, go in just a minute. So I want you to just picture Jesus as he's ascending up into heaven. His eyes are fixed ahead. He is excited about what he's going to see. Do you know what's on his mind? As he Now, this is amazing. Here he, He's ascending from the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where he made his triumphal entry. Now he's making his triumphal exit and his triumphal entry into heaven as the high priest of heaven. But look a little closer. He's a wounded man. He still bears wounds from his sacrifice. And so I believe the Father is there in heaven with his arms outstretched. And Jesus walks into the outer court of heaven. And I can see him almost stumbling. Oh, please get this book undone as I describe that to you. And And he walks up into the Father's outstretched arms and the embrace oh what a moment that must have been as they weep together i think jesus might have said abba because that's what he called god that's the intimate name of the father abba my abba and the son and the, and the father would be saying oh son my son here he is holding his wounded son in his arms at last They are back together. It's the triune reunion. The triune Godhead is at last reunited as the Holy Spirit hovers over them. You can see between those words, the dove is just like a a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And I believe after they weep, I believe every angel is hushed in heaven. Not a sound erupts except the sobbing of father and son in each other's arms. And then finally, The father releases the son, steps back, and I just believe he would have pointed to him and said, thunder through all eternity, behold the lamb slain from the creation of the world. What a divine reunion this was between father and son. And now Jesus sits down on the throne next to the father and the Bible says in Revelation, oh, when you read Revelation, don't get, don't get all caught up and confused by all the details of the vials and the marks and the, and the you know, all the different things. I think people get into com- some kind of strange ideas when they do that. But look at the throne room scenes. Behold the Lamb in eternity. That's what the Bible in Revelation said it's supposed to be about, to give a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, he goes on and says, and to know the things that are ahead. But above all, is to give us a revelation of Jesus Christ, to unveil Christ in the book of Revelation. And so the Bible says that the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is the lamp. He's the glory, the shining glory in eternity. So I just want you to, well, you could look at the, picture of Christ there or, or just close your eyes I, I cannot again I can't say it like I write it here so I pray the Lord will give you vision to see as I try to describe envision him now standing next to his father joy exudes from his heart and his laughter ripples through the courts He smiles, and glory drenches eternity. 
<sighs> Can you just picture that? Glory drenches eternity as he smiles. Now, his eyes wash heaven with love. He slowly lifts his arms. Streams of splendor shine out from the glorified lamb. His glory illumines all of heaven like a bright chandelier. He looks like a fountain of light. Can you see him? See the one whose eyes once spilled teardrops of sorrow, now sparkling with holy fire. See the face once swollen and raw from patches of his beard torn out, now radiating brighter than the light of the sun. See his body, once stripped naked and bathed in blood, now bathed in eternal majesty. Narrow your focus and look at his hands and feet. See the hands that bled from nail holes, bleeding with infinite splendor. See the feet once spiked to a stake of timber, now gleaming like polished brass. See his side, once stabbed with the blade of a sword, now releasing rivers of revival to this earth. Most of all, look at his heart from which this resurrection glory flows. These shining streams will someday fill the whole earth as waters cover the seas. Yes, the glorified lamb is the generating force, the source of God's eternal light. He is the headwaters, the wellspring, the fountainhead of glory. He is the, as the Bible says in Hebrews 1, 3, he is the soul expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine. He's the central sun of the universe, the lamp of all heaven, the day star from on high. As Spurgeon said, he is the sun of our day. He is the star of our night. He is our life. He is our life's life. He is our heaven on earth, and he shall be our heaven in heaven. Now at last, Jesus' prayer is answered. Father, he prayed this right before he went to the cross. He said, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Even as the glory of the Lamb flooded on and on through infinitude before the creation of the world, now the sweet light of the Lamb fills eternity once again. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts so as to beam forth the light for the illumination of the knowledge of the majesty and the glory of God as it is manifest in the person and is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And those aren't my words. That's First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 2, verse 6 in the Amplified. Draw in closer now and gaze upon the Lamb. Slip beyond the outer court filled with tens of thousands of worshiping angels. Enter into the holy place with the worshiping elders. Dare to come even further into the very holy of holies through the blood of the Lamb. See multicolored radiance filling the realms above. Hear rumbles of thunder and watch bolts of lightning flashing around the throne. Breathe in the atmosphere. The very air of heaven floods with glory. Describing this heavenly glory, Bob Sorge writes, just as our sun radiates energy and light, God exudes glory. God is such a dynamically blazing inferno that the radiation of his person is called glory. Glory imbues and sustains all of heaven. It is the air of heaven. The reality of God's glory in the heavenlies is more than, than we can even imagine. His glory is the ultimate reality. It is the tangible manifestation of the infinite beauty and splendor of his magnificent face. Worshippers bask in this glory. Seraphim breathe it in, and all they can do is cry over and over, holy, holy, holy. They cover their faces because they stand so close to his shining wounds. I 
I'll, I'll stop right there. But would you just think about that for a moment? They're in heaven. This is the one who contained the glory, the Shekinah glory, when he came to earth. But now, every wound bleeds glory. Every wound bleeds glory. The Bible says in Habakkuk 3, 4, His splendor was like the sunrise, raised flash from his hand, where his power was hidden. And so now, here's the sun in heaven. And I think he's been saying all along, Father, they're down there praying. Can I send him? Can I send the Holy Spirit? And the Father says, wait, 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 wait. Wait for the day of Pentecost. Wait for the Feast of Pentecost. God has a timing. Oh, golly. Oh, you're so good, Lord. And finally that day arrives. And the priest in the temple is waving, waving those, those uh, it says Pentecost, so it's going to be wheat, those waves of wheat. And he lifts up baked bread and waves it before the Lord. And at some point on the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot is called in Hebrew, the Father says, Now, son, now send down the Holy Spirit. Here they are. They're praying. And here comes the Holy Spirit. And he baptizes them in the Holy Spirit and fire. I know this is a crazy picture when you look at it, but I don't know. I just feel the Lord on it because I feel like, I mean, if you were there and the Holy Spirit was poured out for the first time on earth like this, it would have been unimaginable. The glory that came in. And then the fire that came to rest on all of them. Because John the Baptist said, He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And do you remember when Jesus said, and I've brought this scripture, scripture to you several times, when Jesus said, I have a fire to bring upon this earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Well, here it is. It's kindled right there in the upper room. As the Holy Spirit, the wind and the fire rush in. Now, what happens when wind touches fire? There is a mighty, a conflagration. Do you know what that means? That means a mighty fire, a bursting forest fire. And it all happened because of what he said in the next verse, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. So now his baptism has been completed, that baptism of fire on the cross. And he has baptized them all in the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter stands up and preaches the gospel. I mentioned this yesterday briefly, but Peter says, he he talks about the crucifixion and the resurrection, and then he says, I think he must have pointed his finger. I try not to point my finger when I'm teaching or preaching, but, but I think he would have pointed his finger and said, and you crucified the Lord of glory. Because, but it, that, that's to every one of us. And when they heard those words, the Bible says they were cut to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. I th- believe, I think this picture represents it well. It's a sword with fire. It, I like to speak of the, the, the gospel or the message of the cross as the apostolic sword. Because swords cut. And when Peter spoke those words at Pentecost, they, the, their hearts were cut. They were pierced by the apostolic sword of the cross. But I have a question for you. We have many, we have movements all the, all the time these days talking about the apostolic movement. But here's my question. Where are the apostles who will preach the apostolic message of the cross? Watch what's been happening around the world with those who are preaching the message of the cross. You want to see revival? Watch who starts revival. Who starts revivals? Those who are carrying the message of the cross. Steve Hill, Nathan Morris, Derek Wainwright. You all had a revival in your church. Do you think God could call you to be a revivalist? Wow, what a thought. But the message of the cross is what cuts to people's hearts and brings revival. Now, I want to I I 
look quickly at Paul. Paul was the greatest apostle, evangelist, and revival since Jesus Christ. So he is our model. Boy, did he preach the cross. Let's just look at this two-minute video, which shows us just a touch of the life of, of Paul. People called me Saul once. Or writing it, she, excuse me. Now I make known to you, to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Where did he receive it? From Peter? From Andrew? From God. God gave it to him. God told him the gospel. So now he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. Now, that's the gospel. That's the gospel in a nutshell, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here is a book that's gotten very, very famous. This man, I don't usually mention names, but because this has gotten so big in the body of Christ, especially in, in England, in England they even required some of their church members to read this book. I know it's gotten big in California, Rob Bell is, uh, Oprah considers him her pastor. But look what he says. He says, there's no, now hear the sarcasm in these words. There's nothing wrong with talking and singing about how the blood will never lose its power and nothing but the blood will save us. Those are powerful metaphors. But we don't live any longer in a culture in which people offer animal sacrifices to the gods. People, this is still him writing, people did live that way for thousands of years, and there are pockets of primitive cultures around the world that do continue to understand sin, guilt, and atonement in those ways. Pockets of primitive cultures. Primitive. Ignorant. That's what he's calling us, okay? <laughs> there are, in other words, the people who believe the Bible are primitive cultures. Pockets of primitive cultures around the world that do continue to understand sin, guilt, and atonement in those ways, but most of us don't. What the first Christians did was look around them and put the Jesus story in language their listeners would understand. In other words, they were making sacrifices, so they just made up the story of a sacrifice. That's in that book, and Christians are reading it, and pastors are, are requiring it in England, but it's heresy. It's sheer heresy. The blood of Jesus is not a metaphor. It is a substance that cleanses, heals, delivers, and brings revival. The blood of Jesus has power. And we've been preaching and ministering a blood-drained gospel. But Paul wrote these words. Look at this. He said, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you and are turning to a different gospel Get that, a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be condemned. You see, he's saying, you know, a different gospel, a perverted gospel. And that's why I read you that story a minute ago about that soldier who, who who's he died on the on the battlefield, it seemed. His body went limp. His friend carried him to the medic. They applied the defibrillator. You've seen those defibrillators in airports. It charges your heart. He wouldn't come alive. And then finally, he did get a heartbeat, so he immediately stuck the needle into his veins. And they took him to a hospital and gave him a blood transfusion. And it brought him back to life. That's what we need. We need a defibrillator. Applied to our hearts. But the Holy Spirit does that. Have some of you, honestly, has anyone felt that defibrillation in your heart this week? As we've been looking at the cross, as God's been pouring out his spirit. I know, because I've seen it happen to you. Some of you have actually felt that, that charging of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And you've come alive. Even though some of you didn't get much sleep last night. I don't know why. I can tell, but you've come alive now, so we're good. But God wants to apply the defibrillator to the church and he wants to put a blood transfusion in the church. It, look at this quote. 
If you drain the blood out of the church, all you have left is a corpse. I, I read that in an article. I'm so sorry I don't have his name up there, but I have it in the book. All of this will be in the uh, Undone book. So the Father is looking down on this earth, and I believe he is shaking the whole earth, and he's shaking the church. Are you seeing how the church is being shaken? I mean, people are living in fear because uh, Christians are having their heads cut off. I mean, spilling blood for their, their faith. But God is looking down on this earth, and he's saying, this is my son. Will you live for him? Will you bring him the reward he deserves? Will you bring the blood back into the church? And some people have said, well, you know, the gospel is just the gospel of the kingdom. It's not, it, it doesn't include the cross, resurrection, and or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, they're making up their own story. Because Paul said it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you can talk forever about the cross, honestly. I taught a whole Old Testament survey course, and I always brought it back to the cross. I always brought my New Testament survey course back to the cross. I always brought my Acts course back to the cross at BRSM, Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. Because it's central. And Paul and uh, Charles Spurgeon said, just as all roads lead to Rome, all sermons should lead back to the cross. There is an eternal gospel. It didn't just crop up. Some people have said, well, Jesus didn't, didn't uh, talk about the death, burial, and resurrection much. <laughs> well, because he was it. But Paul preached it. But look at this scripture. This gospel is an eternal gospel. It was started in the covenant of redemption, Fran, before the creation of the world. Look at these words. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Revelation 14, 6. When the word eternal is used, that means it was, it was formulated in the covenant of redemption, which was in eternity before the creation of the world. You see, this is an eternal gospel. That's why you can't change it. You can't say, oh, this is the gospel, or, or, you know, I've heard one teacher says, very popular teacher, he says, the, the gospel is a split gospel. There's, there's the gospel of salvation, and there's the gospel of, I don't even remember what he says, but <laughs> you cannot divide it, and you cannot ever just divide the gospel of salvation, because that's what carries the truth, and the power, and the life. It's a seed, and it has life, it has light within it. So, brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart that we need a revival of the blood of the cross of the Lamb. Do you agree? Oh, yes. Are you going to dedicate yourself to help bring this forth? I just want to close this out with a, just a thought for you to think about. There is an incredible scripture in Leviticus 6. God said to Moses, he said, Every day, the burnt offering, which is a lamb, every morning and every evening, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when Jesus died, actually, 9 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. How ironic. That's when Jesus went on the cross. That's when Jesus died, because he's the fulfillment of the burnt offering. The Holocaust offering, it was literally called. Hollow is burnt, let's say, whole burnt offering. Whole is hollow, burnt is cost. He is the Holocaust offering. But the burnt offering, which is a lamb, there are other animals for burnt offerings, but the one, the daily burnt offering, is always a lamb. So the burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till the morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. And then clean out the ashes, put a lamb on the altar again at 3 o'clock. That's called the evening sacrifice. And then clean out the ashes and put another one there on the uh, 9 o'clock. And you know what? The God said, now when, when you, well, let me just ask you, why? Why was this so important? The lamb was the center of that altar, and the fire never burned out. But let me show you why you can't let the fire burn out. Because just a few chapters later, Leviticus 11, 10 and 11, God set fire down from heaven, and he lit the fire. So now those coals are sacred. 
So you can't take fire from any other place but the altar. And that altar is a picture of the cross. It's where lambs were slain and consumed, just like the cross. It was a picture of Christ and him crucified. And there were little pans down at the bottom, and those coals from the altar were put in those pans. And as they walked, as they traveled through the wilderness, they carried those live coals. Why? Because God had first lit the coals. So they had to keep those coals alive. It was, it was so important because God lit them. Now, they're, they come in every time they stop and they put the tent back up, the tabernacle back up. They use those same coals. We remember that story of Nadab and Abihu in uh, Leviticus 11, 10 and 11? It's a story of strange fire. Why? Because they, one of them took coals of his own making, made fire of his own making. He did not take it off the altar. See, his brother's saying, hey, wait a minute. We were supposed to take coals from the altar, not of our own making. And then they burned incense on, quote, strange fire. Why? Because they took the coals, not from the cross, not from the altar. It wasn't coals that God had lit. It was coals they had lit. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God struck them dead. God struck them dead. He was showing us something. He was showing us when you try to, to, when you minister, when you preach, when you teach, and you don't take coals from the altar of the cross, you're offending a holy God. We are wounding the heart of God because of the magnificent magnitude of the sacrifice that he made. The coals must come from the altar of the cross. And if we want to see revival that never burns out, we've got to keep the lamb on the altar and, and just keep that fire stoked. Keep it always stoked. Because God has a revival fire that he wants to bring on this earth again. Do you believe it? I really believe. And once you've looked at the Father's cup and you've really looked at the cross, don't you agree that we must have a revival of the blood, of the cross, of the lamb? if we want to see a revival that will never burn out. So I want to show you a couple of videos as we close today. Can we go first? Let's see. You probably don't have a Steve Hill video up, do you? Okay. Let's go into a couple of videos from the Brownsville Revival. Let me give you a little background. Steve Hill had been touched by really, it was the Argentine Revival and the revival that had broken out in, Can in uh, Canada in Toronto, but had also gone to Holy Trinity Brompton, and he'd been touched by that fire. Those coals had touched his heart. And when John Kilpatrick had him preach, John Kilpatrick was depressed. His mother had died. He, he just hadn't recovered yet. Had a lot of grief. And Steve said, you know, Pastor, I, I think I'm carrying something. I, I want to, if you'd let me come preach in your church, I think it might be good. So Steve Hill comes and preaches at Brownsville. A lot of you have been to the Brownsville Revival. And it's the first day that he preaches. And the fire of God falls upon that church. And it hits Pastor Kilpatrick. He is out for the rest of the day. He is, in fact, he, he, is, he is so drunk with the Holy Spirit. He can hardly walk. He can hardly put his own clothes on, he says. See, sometimes his son had to put his socks on for him. And he was so inundated for months after the fire of God came into that church. But I want to just show you a couple of, of scenes. But remember this about Steve Hill. God used him to bring that fire, but God used an evangelist, a man, Steve Hill. What does Steve Hill do? He preaches the cross. He preaches repentance. Repentance. We don't hear that much anymore. But that's what Steve Hill preached. And God honored it by bringing revival down. Now, I'm just going to show you some happy scenes from Revival. But I want you, as you sit there and watch this, I want you to just let the Holy Spirit come on you. Amen. Let's go into the Brownsville Revival. YouTube. What? Either one. Yeah, that's, yeah start with that one. That'd be good. Okay, now here's one that's called, Honey, Where Are You From? Where, where, honey, Where Are We From? And here's this lady, they're from, I forgot where they're from, but she's, and pastor's just taking some testimonies. Now watch real carefully and listen real carefully. Uh, 
What's your name? Where are you from? My name is Sandy Fields, and I'm a pastor's wife, and I'm from, um, I'm from, um, I know the feeling. <laughs> We're here to preach the blood. We're here to bring oh, the blood. We're here. Come on. We are here. Oh, yes. Come on up, guys. Everyone, come on up. Oh, come on up. Get in the fountain. Get in the river. Lord, do it again, Jesus. Watch your revival, Lord. We ask for the fires. The fires of revival, Lord. May that altar, the Lamb of God, be the sole purpose of our hearts, of our minds, Lord Jesus. That your fire may burn on our eyes, Lord God. And it may no longer be about our will, Lord, but about your purpose and your will and your prayer, Jesus.
church that we go to tonight, God. Pour out your spirit in that church. Tell you what, we're going to do like we did in the Brownsville Revival. I'm going to go ahead and rent this thing again for tomorrow night. How's that? I'm going to rent this building for tomorrow night. We're going to come back tomorrow night one more time and let's see what God does. Listen, bring your friends. Call on the telephone tomorrow. Tell the people to be here. God's going to do miracles. I'm telling you, God's going to do miracles. I'm going to have service tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, or 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, we're going to be here. You're just supposed to fly to, you're just supposed to, fly to Hawaii, aren't you? The pastor thought that Nathan couldn't get up, but Nathan's going to get up here and start praying for people. Uh-huh. Aren't you supposed to be in Hawaii? Jesus. Guys, for a spirit of humility to be able to bring this message. Listen to me. This reminds me of Father's Day of 1995. It feels like Father's Day of 1995. Oh God, do it again! Do it again! Do it again! Do it again! Father's Day 95, hold your hand up. Let me see if you were here. Were you there? Doesn't this remind you of Father's Day 95? Feels so much like it. Hey, you know what? I'm talking about hosting a revival. I don't even have a church. I don't even have a church. So that means God's got to do some quick stuff. I wouldn't be surprised what the Holy Spirit does. Pray for each other, guys. If you're feeling fire on you, it's to give it away. Let's sing that chorus together, hallelujah, and let's worship the Lord. Mm. Come on. Our evangelist is just no good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
you like we did in the Brownsville Revival. I'm going to go ahead and rent this thing again for tomorrow night. How's that? I'm going to rent this building for tomorrow night. We're going to come back tomorrow night one more time and let's see what God does. Listen, bring your friends. Call them so that was the beginning of the Bay of the Holy Spirit Revival. And God's getting ready to do it again. And he's fallen on you and you've caught the fire. And he's going to raise you up. Honestly, guys, just keep a pure heart. You young ones, just fight lust with everything you're worth. Fight bitterness and gossip with everything you're worth. And let the Holy Spirit use you. And you that are older, oh, I mean, it is time. It is time. It is time. It is time to carry what you've always wanted, what you've always looked for. You guys that are older, you know, even though you've been so dedicated to the Lord, it's been, you still had not found what you were looking for, but you found it. You found it at the foot of the cross. You found the fire of revival that burns at the cross. If we cease to preach the gospel and the cross, the coals will go out. Keep the lamb on the altar. Lord, we ask for more. More of your power. More of your Carry this home, guys. More of your glory. More of your glory. Carry this home. 